Well, it's cold outside, but is it, but is it warm inside? Yes. Amen. A great privilege to be here. You know, I just flew in yesterday from California, and uh, so it would be easier to go through the now ubiquitous metal detectors. I thought it would be wise for me to wear my flip-flops. Uh, so I put my flip-flops on in California, and as I arrived in Michigan in 24-degree weather, I realized that that was not such a good plan. And my wife is still in California. Her, her sister is giving birth right at this very moment. And she wants to be there with her, so I flew back here. And it is a privilege to be here in cold but beautiful Michigan. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about the series. This is a brand new series that we have put together. And the title of the series is 11th Hour Evidence. 11th Hour Evidence. Now, you will notice that in that title, there is the juxtaposition of two themes, two major themes. The first is 11th hour, and the second is evidence, 11th hour evidence. Now, before we get into the message proper this evening, I'd like to sort of walk you through the significance of that title, 11th hour evidence. Let's begin with the term 11th hour. If you have your Bibles, just go with me quickly to Revelation, or pardon me, Romans chapter 13. Now, we will begin the message proper in a few moments, but just a few preliminary remarks. Romans chapter 13. Romans what chapter are we going to, everyone? 13. 13. Romans chapter 13. And here in verse 11, the Apostle Paul makes a remarkable statement. Romans chapter 13, and I'm beginning in verse 11. The Apostle Paul says this, And do this, knowing the what? Time. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. That is a power-packed verse of Scripture, friends. He says two things in there. The first thing he says is, we should know the time. Now, if I ask you what time it was, you might look at your watch and say, Pastor Ashrick, it's 7.06. That is not what the Apostle Paul is talking about. The Apostle Paul is talking about in the big scheme of things, in the grand scheme of the universal conflict, the great cosmic controversy between good and evil and light and darkness, he is saying you should know the time. And then he says that second theme. He says it is high time. It is what, everyone? High time, high time to do what? Wake to wake out of sleep. What is the Apostle Paul saying here? Among other things, what he is saying is, is that we are living closer to the second coming of Jesus than when we first believed. Amen. Now, friends, that is good news. Amen. At the end of this message tonight, we will be 50 minutes closer to the second coming of Jesus. Amen. Now, when I make the statement that we are living in the 11th hour, that I believe we are living in the very closing moments, the very closing seconds of Earth's history, that is not just a fantastical, religious, wild-eyed statement. I believe that is a calm, reasoned, intelligent statement. And this introduces the second element. Eleventh hour, we're living in the last days, but what's that next word? Evidence. Evidence. And so you have the juxtaposition of these two themes. For somebody to stand on a busy street corner with a placard that says, the end is near, this may or may not be particularly convincing evidence that we are living in the last moments. The goal of the next 14 messages will be to demonstrate to you, not only are we actually living in those days immediately preceding the second coming of Jesus, that is to say the very last days of earth's history, but we will do our very best by the grace of God to give you evidence to that effect. To give you what, everyone? Evidence. So that's sort of the title. You have a feel for it now. This seminar is going to be very different than other seminars that we have had on 3ABN. This will be designed to, to demonstrate that there is actual, empirical, knowable, testable proof. What word did I say? Proof. proof. Sometimes we think of the whole realm of religion as being in the realm of the ethereum, that which really can't be known, and if you feel it, it's true, and if you don't feel it, it's not true. We are going to take a very different kind of stand in this seminar. We are going to try and demonstrate with proof, with what word again? Proof. proof and evidence that we are in fact living in the very last days. And so that sort of introduces you to the title, 11th Hour Evidence. Now let's look at one more passage of Scripture, then I want to go to the screen briefly. The second passage I want to show you is in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter, in what chapter are we going to? 1 Peter chapter 3. The Apostle Peter says something remarkable here, and I'd like you to see that. 1 Peter chapter 3. 
And notice with me verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, and actually to set the context, we'll look at verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. He says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Now hone in on verse 15. Set your crosshairs on verse 15. The Apostle Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The word sanctify means set aside for a holy purpose. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a... I'm reading from the New King James. It says a defense. If you're reading in the Old King James, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer. And notice what it goes on to say here. To give an answer or a defense to everyone that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, let's think about that for just a moment. Peter here is, is encouraging, he's admonishing Christians to be able to give an answer to how many? To how many? To every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. But what were those last two words there? With meekness and fear. In other words, when we give an answer, it should not be a proud answer or a boastful answer. It should be a meek answer, friends. So what kind of answer? A meek answer. Now, notice this. He actually is urging us here to be able to give an answer. Now, an adequate answer is implied. In other words, simply saying, well, that's what I believe, is not an adequate answer. If somebody were to say to you, well, why do you believe that Jesus is coming soon? Do you actually believe we're living in the last hours of earth's history? And you said, well, that's what my pastor says, so that's what I believe. Is that an adequate answer? I read a book that said that that's what was going to take place. Is that an adequate answer? What Peter is encouraging us here is to be able to give an adequate, compelling, convincing, persuasive answer for the reasons that you believe what it is that you believe. Amen? Amen. And my pastor said, or a book said, or somebody said, or my parents believed is not an adequate, compelling, convincing answer. Now, interestingly here, the word that is translated to give an answer or to give a defense, that's how we render it in the English, the word that is there rendered thusly in the Greek language is the word apologia, apologia. Now, if you soften the G sound there, what does that sound like? It sounds like apology. But the word here is not apologize in the sense that you and I in our modern vernacular think of apologize. The Greek word apologia means to be able to give an answer, to give a reason, or to give a defense. And the very purpose of the next 14 nights of our being together will be able to give a compelling, rational, reasonable, and yet thoroughly biblical answer as to why we believe what we believe. Now, can you say amen to that? Amen. Now, I'd like to invite you to go to the screen with me and consider something. Our message is entitled, Pascal's Wager, You Bet Your Life. Pascal's wager, you bet your life. Now, we'll be there in just a moment, but notice this. In the title, we have this phrase, 11th hour evidence. And for many people, the putting together of these two concepts, these two uh, ideas, 11th hour and evidence, or faith and evidence, is not really consistent. Some people have this idea that faith is over here in the realm of what is sort of ethereal and ambiguous and this kind of a thing, and evidence is in the realm of empiricism. It's what we know. It's what science teaches us. And somehow that faith and evidence are not complementary but contradictory. Now, notice this incredible quotation here on the screen. It's actually the classical biblical formulation of faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the, what's that next word there? The evidence of things, what everyone? Now notice this, in the classical formulation of what faith is, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, faith and evidence are not set as contradictory or as standing in contradistinction, they are given to us as complementary. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, it is the what? The evidence of things not seen. Now notice this, the next slide I'd like to show you is actually from an incredible book, an incredible book, one of the most translated books in all of the world, really. It's a book titled Steps to Christ. This is taken from page 105. Notice the sublimity of this thought. It says, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient, what's the next word? <laughs> Evidence upon which to base our faith. He never asks us to believe without giving us sufficient evidence. Now notice the next line here. It continues. His existence, that's what we'll talk about tonight and in the coming nights, his character also, 
the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason, and this testimony is abundant. Our faith must rest upon what, everyone? Evidence. Evidence. And notice again, those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. faith. Now, if you were counting, you would have noticed that that word evidence occurred three times there in a few sentences. In other words, the author that is writing here, just like the author of Hebrews, is trying to tell us that faith and evidence are not antithetical concepts. Faith and evidence are not inimical to one another. They are complementary. In fact, I would go so far as to say that all faith is based on evidence. Faith is not a leap into the unknown, but a step into the light. Not a leap in the darkness, but a step into the light. And so, friends, tonight we are going to give what I consider to be one of the single most compelling evidences that God exists. Yet beyond this, one of the single most compelling evidences that I know that you should follow God, that you should love Him with all of your heart, and you should make Him the chief priority of your life, your goals, your aspirations, and your aims. Our message tonight is entitled Pascal's Wager. Following these introductory remarks, we are now ready to launch into this message, and I think that you will be challenged, you will have your uh, intellect uh, peaked, and you will be forced to think. You will be forced to what did I say, everyone? Amen. We hear far too many sermons in this day and age, and far too many messages, whether through the media or some other medium, that do not require us to think. You will be required to think this evening. One of my favorite quotations is from Will Durant. Will Durant, the great histor uh, historian of modernity, said these words. He said, if you make people think they are thinking, they will love you. But if you make them think, they will hate you. Friends, our goal this evening is not just to think we are thinking, but to actually be thinking candidly and transparently about the greatest, most sublimest, incredible thoughts in all the universe, namely the existence of God, His character, His nature, and this will be the purpose of this entire series. Does that sound good to you? Amen. Well, I suppose that's why you're here. We're so glad that you are all here with us today and also our television audience who is looking in. Let us begin, as we will always begin, with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are humbled to call you Father. And yet this is how Jesus taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven. And so, Father, we are coming to you this evening asking that you will please come down and be our teacher. Father, we need more than the teachings of a man. We need the teachings of your Spirit. You have promised to give these. We think of John chapter 16 and verse 13 that says, The Spirit of truth will come and lead us, guide us into not some truth, not most truth, but all truth. And Father, as we begin now this inaugural session, we pray that your Spirit will come and meet with us Spend time with us, and Father, teach us. Lord, you have been with us hitherto. We have been blessed by the beautiful song, by the introduction. And now as we launch into a study of your word, we pray that you will be right near us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone can say, Amen. Amen. Our message is entitled, Pascal's Wager. With a showing of hands, I'm wondering how many people here this evening know the name Blaise Pascal. That name means something to you. Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, good. Just a few. Well, let me try to introduce to you a man by the name of Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician and scientist. He was born in 1623 and died at the age of 39 in 1662. At the age of 31, he experienced a conversion to Christianity and he began to write out his thoughts, his ideas, and his, his apologetic, his defense of the Christian faith. Mr. Pascal had planned to write an exhaustive defense of the Christian faith in which he would give all of the evidences that he had come to believe for the Christian faith, yet he died prematurely. And all of his thoughts now have been put together in a compendium that is simply titled Pensies, and that word means to think or to deliberate. Blaise Pascal was, as we have said, a scientist, a mathematician. In addition to that, he was, he was very respected in his day and age as, as a scientist, as a mathematician, and as a philosopher and theologian. Now, in the middle of that little volume, Pensies, 
One of Blaise Pascal's most famous writings, arguably his most famous writing, has come to be handed down to us and is simply known as The Wager. As The Wager. And in common parlance, we refer to it as Pascal's Wager. Now, before I actually read you a summary of The Wager, let me try to set the stage for you here just briefly. Remember that Blaise Pascal was a mathematician. He was a what, everyone? And this raises a legitimate question. How would it be that a very intelligent, erudite man would come to be a Christian? You will be surprised to learn tonight, perhaps, that it was actually mathematics that led him to a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we are living in a day and age in which science is being set over here and religion over here. And we are being told that in order to be an intelligent person, you must put your faith on the shelf and believe what science has handed down. We will be talking about that in great detail during this series. I want you to know that history bears out, and there are even many contemporary individuals that would bear out, that you can still be a very intelligent individual and have a rock-solid faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to put your intelligence on the shelf. You don't have to put your thinking machine on the shelf in order to be a Christian. Can you say amen? amen. In fact, Jesus didn't come to disable men's minds. Jesus came to enable and to set free the minds of men and women. Can you say amen? amen. So this idea that somehow Christianity is inimical or antithetical to thinking is absolutely without ground. So then what about Blaise Pascal? What was his wager, that little writing of two or three pages, originally written in the French and now translated into the English? I wish I had time to read it to you this evening, but let me just give you a synopsis of Pascal's wager, and then we will begin to un unpack the significance of this wager. Here it is. This is what Blaise Pascal said. God either exists or he doesn't. Based on the testimony of both general revelation, that is nature, the created works, and special revelation, that is the scriptures, Blaise Pascal said, it is safe to assume that God does, in fact, exist. It is, he surmised, abundantly fair to concede that there is at least a 50% chance that the Christian creator God exists. He said, therefore, since we stand to gain eternity and thus infinity, the wise or safe choice is to live as though he does exist. If we are right, we gain everything and lose how much? Nothing. If we are wrong, we lose nothing and we gain nothing. Therefore, based on simple mathematics, Pascal reasoned that only the fool would choose to live the godless life. This is a simplified version of the wager. Now, do you understand the, the larger premise, yes or no? God either exists or he doesn't. And if there is, let's say, Pascal was abundantly fair to the skeptic and to the infidel, he said, let's just say there's only a 50% chance that the Christian creator God exists. Since we stand to gain everything, if that's true, and lose nothing, and if it's not true, we lose nothing and still gain nothing, he said only the fool would choose to live the godless life. Now, I just finished reading a remarkable book entitled Fermat's Enigma, written by Simon Singh. And in this book, he talks a little bit about Blaise Pascal. And I want to just read this to you because I think you'll find it very fascinating. It says, Pascal founded the essential rules that govern all games of chance and that can be used by gamblers to define perfect playing and betting strategies. Furthermore, these laws of probability have found applications in a whole series of situations ranging from speculating on the stock market to estimating the probability of a nuclear accident. Pascal was even convinced that he could use his theories to justify an intelligent belief in God. He stated, and I quote, quoting Pascal now, the excitement that a gambler feels when making a bet is equal to the amount he might win multiplied by the probability of winning it. He then argued that the possible prize of eternal happiness has an infinite value and that the probability of entering heaven by leading a virtuous life, no matter how small, is certainly finite. Therefore, according to Pascal's definition, religion was a game of infinite excitement and one worth playing because multiplying an infinite prize by a finite probability results in infinity. Now, do you follow that, yes or no? It's basically a distillation of his wager saying, it's better to be safe and err on the side of intelligence than sorry and err on the side of ignorance. Now, has anybody in this room, all of you pious saints, I'm looking out, very pious, has anybody in this room ever gambled? 
ever bet on something? Raise your hands if you've ever bet on something. You know, I asked that question one time in South Africa. I'm going to get myself into trouble with all the South Africans. I was speaking to a congregation of probably five or 6,000, and I asked the question, has anybody in this congregation ever bet? And can you believe the hands were just like this? <laughs> Nobody willing to admit that they had ever wagered a wager or, or bet a bet. The truth of the matter is, is we have sometimes rather innocuous kinds of bets. We're all say, maybe when I was young, I would have said to my brother, I'll bet you a, a nickel I can jump over that puddle. You know, that's the harmless bet. And then there are more advanced kinds of bets. Now, the, the point tonight is not to talk about the merits or demerits of gambling, because I think there really are no merits. But listen very carefully. There is one gamble that everybody in this room, in fact, everybody in the world is going to make. And that is the gamble of your life. That is why this message is entitled, Pascal's Wager, You Bet Your Life. Now, when you make a gamble or a wager, you consider three factors. How many factors, everyone? Three. three factors. And let's go over these very carefully so we understand each of them. We want to set the parameters for this, and then we're going to go directly to an incredible story right in the Gospel of Mark that will unpack this for us in an incredibly profound way. When you go to bet, or when you go to think about a wager, or when people who do wager and those kinds of things, when they think about this, there are three factors that affect whether or not that is an intelligent wager, wager or a wager that is probably not best to enter into. The first is the size of the prize. The size of the what, everyone? Prize. Size of the prize. The second is the size of the risk. The size of the what? Risk. risk. And the third is the chances or the probability of actually winning. So you have the size of the prize, the size of the risk, and the chances of winning. The size of the prize, the size of the risk, and the chances of winning. Now, let's just take a, a modern, common, contemporary gambling situation, the lottery. And let's plug the lottery into our little three-tiered equation, and let's see if we can think why some people, let's see if we can try to get our fingers wrapped around why it might be that some people would spend their money on a lottery ticket. Let's begin with the first one. The size of the prize to be gained. Is that a large prize or a small prize? Large. Usually very large, several million dollars in some cases. And probably for most of us in this room, that would be very nice to have. So the size of the prize is very large. Now the second is, what's the size of the risk? Now I don't know because I don't buy lottery tickets, but I'll bet you they're just a couple dollars or two. So what's the size of the risk involved if a lottery ticket costs just a dollar? Is it a large risk or a small risk? Small risk. So notice what we have so far. We have a large prize, several million dollars. We have a small risk. And so everybody's thinking, it's time to run out and buy lottery tickets. But the third element is where the rub takes place, isn't it? What are the chances of actually winning the promised prize? In the lottery, are they what? Small or are they large? Very small. They say that the chances of, of getting struck by lightning twice is greater than the chances of winning the New York lottery. Now, why would somebody purchase a lottery ticket knowing that the chances of winning are so infinitesimally small? Chiefly because of this. The size of the prize is so large that it motivates. The size of the risk is so small, even though they know their chances are very small that they will win, we can at least understand somewhat the beginnings of the rationale as to why somebody would enter into that kind of a wager. Now, I don't recommend that. I don't think that's uh, a principle of being a good steward, and I certainly don't. But we can at least enter into the mindset of somebody who would buy a lottery ticket. Size of the prize is large. Size of the risk is minuscule. Chances of winning are, sure, they're, they're infinitesimally small, but because the risk is so small, what are they really losing? Now, the same principle applies to those slot machines in Las Vegas. You know, you put a quarter in or a nickel in. I actually read an article one time on the plane in which there is a slot machine at a particular casino in Las Vegas, I do not know, where you walk up to the teller and you hand them $1,000 in cash and they give you a little token, a little coin. And you walk over to this slot machine, it's very tall, maybe 10 or 15 feet tall, and you put that into that slot machine, and then you pull it down. Now, you just put a $1,000 coin into that machine, friends. Now, think about this. You think the size of the prize is large? It better be. But what's the size of the risk involved? Way too much for you and I, amen? Hey, listen, if a dollar's too much, a $1,000 is out of the question. But we can begin to understand why it might be that somebody would put a nickel into a slot machine or a quarter into a slot machine. Again, we don't recommend this, but the concept is at least easy to understand. 
The size of the prize is very large compared to the amount of risk that is involved. Chances of winning are low, sure, but the risk is so small. Now, I have given this message uh, a few times at Christian academies and even at, at Christian universities, and I love to put it this way. Let's change things around a little bit and let's see if we can't make a wager that might be attractive to some and unattractive to others. Consider with me that we are going to flip a coin. We're going to flip a coin. Now, what are the chances that it'll come up heads? 50%. 50%. And let's say that the parameters of this wager are simply this. We're going to flip the coin, and if you call it heads, and it is heads, you instantaneously win, say, $10 million, no taxes. It's yours. It's in the bank account. $10 million. Large sum of money? Significantly large. Now, let's say that if you lose, you call heads and it comes up tails, you spend the next five years of your life in prison. Right? Now, when I ask this at, at, at academies, it is remarkable, and Christian institutions, it is remarkable that there are always a few people interested in taking that wager. Now, I'm looking out and I can tell that this is a very bright group in here. And my hunch is there are very few, if any, who'd be willing to take that wager in here. Now, let's think about this for just a moment. What's the size of the prize in this fictitious wager? Is it large? It's quite large, isn't it? But here's the rub. What's the size of the risk involved? It could be potentially be very large, isn't it? I mean, to spend five years of your life in prison, it's very large. But what makes the wager potentially attractive? What are the chances of actually winning the promised prize? 50%. In fact, I was just recently at a Christian institution, a medical school, and I, I delivered this very same lecture. And there were several hundred lecture, and there were several hundred people there. And I said to them, I said, now, how many of you would be willing to accept this wager? And very few hands went up, maybe 20 or 30. And I thought, wow. You're at medical school here. You're already giving five years of your life to prison. I figured every hand would go up. <laughs> Everybody was laughing but the professors. <laughs> Friends, we can begin to take any wager, any gamble, any bet, and if you just plug it into this three-tiered equation, the size of the prize, the size of the risk, and the chances of actually winning, you can begin to realize whether or not this is an intelligent, rational wager or a wager that you shouldn't spend time or money on. Now, go with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3 and verse 16. John chapter 3 and verse 16. And you're saying, John 3, 16, what does this text have to do with a wager. What does this text have to do with a gamble? John chapter 3 and verse 16, probably the very best known passage of Scripture in all of the Holy Bible. John chapter 3 and verse 16, Jesus here is having that clandestine conversation with the wise man Nicodemus. In the midst of that conversation, as it sort of draws to a climax, Jesus says in John chapter 3 and verse 16, you can repeat it with me. He said, listen, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, let's just for a moment, let's enter into the mind of a skeptic. Let's enter into the mind of somebody like who I was eight years ago or who Jason was, you know, eight to ten years ago. Somebody who has not yet made the decision to follow Jesus. And Jesus here makes this remarkable claim to Nicodemus. Jesus here says, God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, size of the risk, but have everlasting life. Now, friends, what does the word everlasting mean? It means it lasts for how long? Forever. Like the great song Amazing Grace says, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing His praise than when we first begun. So after we have spent the first billion years in heaven, we would still have only the opening seconds of eternity behind us. Are you with me now? Yes or no? In other words, it's a very long time. So the size of the prize. Now, remember here, we're entering into the mind of a skeptic. We're trying to understand how would we explain to somebody who has not yet made this decision why they should consider making this very decision. Now, if we accept John 3.16 on its own terms, 
If we accept the words of Jesus as valid and as legitimate, let's now plug this gospel wager into our three-tiered equation. Are you ready to do that? Number one, what is the size of the prize to be potentially gained if we accept the gospel wager on its own terms? What's the size of the prize? It, how long? Huge, I like that. Yeah, huge would be an understatement. It would be infinitely large. Is that true, yes or no? Yes. It would be a true mathematical infinity. When we've been there a billion years, we still have a billion, 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 billion more years to be there. After all, it's everlasting life. So the size of the prize, infinitely large. Now, what's the size of the risk? Let's accept this. I, I like what I heard somebody say, no risk. Let's, let's skip this one for just a moment. Let's come back to the size of the risk. And let's ask the second question. What, according to this wager, are the chances of actually winning? Now, if we accept it on its own terms, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that... What's that next word, everyone? Whosoever. Whosoever. How many would that include? Everybody. That would mean everybody. That's another way of saying everybody. So then, according to Jesus, how many could actually win the promised prize? And what would be your chances of winning? A hundred percent. Now, we have answered two of the three questions. The size of the prize is infinitely large. The chances of winning is what? One hundred percent, if we accept the gospel claim on its own terms. Now, we only need to answer that second question. What is the size of the risk involved to submit your whole life, your whole goal, your aspirations, everything that you are about to the Lord Jesus Christ? Go with me to the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10. Mark, what chapter are we going to, everyone? Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, and here we find the story of the rich young, do you know it? The rich young ruler, the rich young ruler has approached Jesus and said, in essence, good master, I would like to go to heaven. What, what do I do? He said, keep the commandments. He said, I've done all this. Wonderful, you only lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. The Bible says he went away very sorrowful because he was very rich. Now this turned the disciples' world upside down. Here was not only a Jew, but here was a wealthy Jew. And in the disciples' paradigm, in the disciples' world, if you were a Jew, you were surely in. And if you were a rich Jew, this was a sure indication of the favor of God. And so you were in twice over. And yet Jesus says something very remarkable when the rich young ruler walks away. He says, it is difficult for a rich man to be saved. Now, in the context of this, the disciples were beside themselves. They protested, who then can be saved? And that sets the context now for our story. We're in Mark chapter 10. And notice with me here, beginning in verse 26. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, how many things are possible? All things are possible. Then be Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Now, Peter says something here that is very interesting, and let's, let's see what is the statement behind the statement that Peter is making. Peter says there in verse 28, See, in other words, look, we have left how much? All, all and followed you. Now, what, what had Jesus said to the rich young ruler? Sell how much? all that you have. And he had gone away very sorrowful. Now, now, Peter here does something that's very intuitive. He has seen that the rich young ruler was willing to give up all. Now, surely the rich young ruler had more in terms of material possessions than Peter. Yet Peter here ventures. He has the guts. He has the temerity to look to Jesus and say, but Jesus, we have left all and followed you. Now, what's implied in what Peter's saying? What, what did what'd you say? That's exactly right. What's in it for us? You had just said to the rich young ruler that if he would leave all and follow you, you would give him riches in heaven, that he would have eternal life. And Peter now looks at the rest of the disciples and he says, we have left all and followed you. And in that statement is a question. And that question, the implied question is, what's in it for us? Now, I want you to notice something here. Jesus gives Peter a, a remarkable answer. And that answer has two elements, two tiers. How many elements, everyone? Two. Two. Now, notice Jesus' answer. Notice Jesus' answer. Verse 29. Jesus speaking, Assuredly, I say to you, you can have confidence in this. Assuredly. The root word there is sure. Confidence. Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's 
verse 30, who shall not receive a hundredfold, notice the next four words, now in this time. Say those four words with me. Now in this time. Well, how much fold? How much fold? A hundredfold. And what are those four words? Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, he adds, and notice the next five words, in the age to come, eternal life. Now, do you see the two phases here of Jesus' answer, yes or no? Remember, what was, the, uh, what was the implied question in Peter's statement? See, Lord, we have left all and followed you. And the implication is, what's in it for us? And Jesus does not here rebuke Peter. Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter and say, oh, you're just in it for selfish motivations. Jesus understands that sometimes our motivations are not as pure as they could and should be. Amen. What Jesus does is he encourages Peter by saying to him, Peter, I'm going to give you a two-tiered response. And the first part is he says, I will give you a 100-fold better, more satisfying, more exhilarating, more life now in this time and in the age to come, five words, eternal life. Amen. Notice the remarkable claim here of Jesus. Friends, this is a testable claim that Jesus has made. Jesus has just said to Peter that if you follow me, I will give you, what everyone? A 100-fold better life in the here and now. In other words, according to Jesus, following him and being a disciple of his is not just pie in the sky by and by. It is a better, more fuller, more filling and exhilarating, satisfactory life in the here and now. Now, can somebody say amen? amen. Now, if that's true, and friends, I want to testify tonight that it is true. Amen. But if it's true, let's enter back into the mind of the skeptic. Remember the three questions? The size of the prize. How large is the prize? Infinitely large. The size of the risk. If Jesus' claim is true, that the life of the Christian, the life of the disciple, is 100-fold better in the here and now, then the size of the risk is non-existent. In fact, there's actually a positive benefit to be gained by entering into the wager. Do you understand that? Yes or no? Now, friends, that's either true or false. That is a testable hypothesis. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You could become a follower of Jesus. You could look back after two, three, four, five, six, seven years, and you could evaluate transparently, candidly, and even empirically, you could evaluate, has my life been better, fuller, and more satisfying since I became a Christian? And I want to testify tonight that if I could exchange the first 23 years of my non-Christian life for the last month of my Christian life, I would not make that exchange because one month with Christ, one day with Christ, one minute with Christ is better than a lifetime without Him. Amen. Now think about that for just a moment. We can begin to understand why Blaise Pascal said only the fool would choose to live the godless life because the size of the prize is infinitely large. The size of the risk is non-existent. In fact, there's a positive benefit to be gained by entering into the wager. And number three, the chances of winning are what, everyone? 100%. Now, I am beginning to like the sound of this gospel wager. Amen? Amen? Amen. Jesus gives two, two phases, two spheres to that answer. He says, number one, I will give you a better life in the here and now, a 100-fold better life in the here and now. Now, Jesus adds an important phrase there that I want to just look at for a moment. He said, with persecutions. With persecutions. What did he mean by that? Chiefly this, when we surrender our whole heart, our whole life, and everything to Jesus... There is somebody on the other side of this equation that is not pleased with that decision. His name is Satan or Satan. The word means adversary or enemy. And friends, when you make a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, you can just guarantee that there will be troubles, there will be difficulties, but I repeat for you a beautiful sublime line that I saw in a poem several years ago. It said, Jesus never promised smooth sailing, but he did promise a safe landing. Friends, there may come at times persecutions. There may come at times tribulations, vicissitudes, and difficulties, but I want you to know persecution with the assurance of eternal life, 
Tribulation with the assurance of Jesus at your right hand is far better than a life of pleasure, leisure, luxury, and ease without the confidence that Jesus is with you. Amen. Amen. Friends, there's reasons. There are reasons that some of the superstar elite whether they be sports stars, rock stars, or music stars, there is reason that many of these people end up ending their own lives. Now think about that for just a moment. In, in our world, in our society, in our little sphere, they have arrived. And yet, friends, remarkably, what do we learn? That having fame, fortune, money, and all of the amenities that come with that life cannot satisfy the deepest longings of the soul. Persecutions, even persecutions with the Lord Jesus is far better than leisure and luxury without the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me share with you a remarkable uh, statistic, a little uh, factoid that you will probably find very interesting. How many of you remember several years ago, I, I believe it was 1997, a man by the name of Marshall Applewhite led 39 people to commit a large mass suicide. Remember the Heaven's Gate cult? And they were going to go sailing there uh, in a comet or in a spaceship behind the comet Hale-Bopp and they committed mass suicide there. How many of you remember that? Okay, terrible. It's tragic, is it not? Now, the city that that took place in is a city in California called Rancho Santa Fe. Rancho Santa Fe. Now, you will be very interested to know that for the last decade, most of those years in the last 10 years, Rancho Santa Fe has been the wealthiest per capita town in the entire United States. The wealthiest town in the wealthiest country. And remarkably, coincidentally, or is it coincidence, that same town is the site of the largest mass suicide on United States soil. Friends, what message does this send to you and I? Simply this, money, fame, prestige, Wealth and all of the accoutrements that come with that kind of a life cannot satisfy the deepest longings and desires of the human heart. Amen. Jesus said a 100-fold better life in the here and now. Will there be persecutions at times? Sure. Will there be difficulties at times, tribulations? Sure. In fact, many times when people first begin to follow the Lord, they find that there's a resistance. But friends, listen. If there's a resistance, it is probably a very good indicator that you are on the right path. Now, in closing, I'd like for you to see something in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Go with me to our last verse, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Toward the end of the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul to the young man Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I cite this verse for you as somebody who is very interested in exercise. Anybody else here interested in exercise, staying in good shape physically? Oh, come on, every hand should be going up. We'll put the camera on you and we'll have all of your relatives see this person is not interested. This is why his size, the size of his pants is always going up. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 8, the, the, the Apostle Paul is writing to young Timothy and I want you to notice what he says here very quickly. The Apostle Paul says, for bodily exercise profits a little. In other words, it's all right. You want to go do your push-ups, your sit-ups, your running. He says, fine. Bodily exercise is good for you. But notice what he says in the rest of verse 8. But godliness, but what word is that, everyone? God. Godliness is profitable for all things. And notice again, the two phases or the two tiers of what he says here. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which what, everyone? Is to come. Do you see what the Apostle Paul is saying? He's saying, hey, look, you want to get some exercise? Fine. You want to stay in good shape? Fine. That's good for you in the here and now. He says, but far better to have godliness. Now, I believe it's far better to have both. Amen? Amen. A little exercise, a little godliness, throw in both. The better life in the here and now. But notice what he says. Godliness is profitable for all things. Having two promises, friends, the promise of the life that now is and of the life to come. That's exactly like Jesus' answer to Peter. A 100-fold better life, four words, now, in this time. And he said, in the life to come, in the age to come, eternal life. Both Jesus and Paul agree that for the Christian, life is better, more satisfying, more fuller, and more glorious in the here and now. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, if we plug that into our three-tiered equation, what have we learned? Size of the prize, infinitely large. Size of the risk is? 
non-existent. And more than non-existent, there's a positive benefit to be gained by entering into the wager. Amen? Amen? In fact, friends, if you come to the end of your life and you have lived a godly life, you've been kind and gracious and you have, you have lived by the great golden rule, you've served the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, and in the, in the unlikely, highly unusual, uh, absurd event that God is not real and He really doesn't exist, you have lost nothing. And yet, friends, I report to you tonight as a minister of the gospel that God is real. He is on the throne. And if you choose to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, and soul, when you come to that day, you will be looking forward to an eternity of joys and blisses and glories in the celestial kingdom. Friend, don't you want to be there? Can you imagine anything better than being in that glorious celestial kingdom? Let me tell you a story. It was Oak, I was in Oakland, California. It was probably six and a half years ago. I'd been a Christian for just about a year. And a friend of mine, and actually there were several of us, we were called to go to Oakland, California. We were ministering there as Bible workers in one of the most impoverished areas in, in that little area. And we got a call from a good friend of ours. His name is Will. And Will went to school at the University of California at Berkeley. And he was the president of the University of California at Berkeley, Seventh-day Adventist Student Association. That's a number of syllables, isn't it? And he said, look, we're going to be giving out some literature. And we would like you and your friends to come over and to give us some literature, hand out some literature with us. And so we decided we would do that. And we, we acquiesced and we went and the day had come. Now, this wasn't just any ordinary day. This was a special day. And there was a student fair that day. And, and every group that you can imagine was assembled together. Not only the religious groups. The Presbyterians were there. The Methodists. The Wesleyans. The Catholics. All kinds of Protestant groups, groups were there. Also, all the governmental groups were there. The anarchists. The communists. The, Presby or the Democrats. The Republicans. All of them were there as well. So here you have all of these different student groups there, people for the ethical treatment of animals and the students against racism. All of these different groups were assembled together. And here we were with our humble little booth. It was just a wooden table with a vinyl banner over the top. And it said, University of California at Berkeley, Seventh-day Adventist Student Association. We had a few books there, some pamphlets, some literature, and uh, some things that were talking about what would be going on that year in the association. Well, we were having a great time going here and going there and, and visiting with this group and visiting with this group, doing our best to hand out literature. As the day was kind of drawing to an end, I had gone back to the table and I was sitting there sort of by myself and there was maybe an hour or two left in the student fair. A nice looking gentleman, maybe in his late 40s or early 50s, came and he sat down right across the booth there for, from the table from me and he asked me a very interesting question and he said to me this. He said, do you believe in God? And I responded in the affirmative. I said, yes, I believe in God. He then asked me, is your God omnibenevolent, omnipotent, and all-knowing? And I said, yes, he is. He is all of those things. He then asked me a question that might sound kind of curious to you. He said to me, do you believe in the philosophical law of non-contradiction? I repeat, do you believe in the philosophical law of non-contradiction? I said to him, of course I affirm the philosophical law of non-contradiction, for it is the basis of all rationality and reason. He was a little taken back by that response, as you can imagine. He said to me, if you affirm the philosophical law of non-contradiction, which basically says that the same thing cannot be true and false in the same way at the same time. He said, do you believe that your omnipotent, omnibenevolent God could create a square circle? And I said he wouldn't. Now think about that for just a moment. A square circle in Euclidean geometry is an impossibility. They are two mutually exclusive geometrical figures. A square, four right angles, four sides, each equal. And a circle, you have an epicenter, and each point on the geometric figure is equidistant from the center. And so these are two mutually exclusive figures. He was asking, could my omnipotent, omnibenevolent God, the God of the Bible, make a square circle or a squircle? I responded by saying, he wouldn't. He said, you're avoiding the question. I said, he wouldn't. You're avoiding the question. He wouldn't. You're avoiding the question. This went on for some time. He then took a different approach, and he said, what about your God? Could he make a mountain so big that he himself couldn't move it? And I said, he couldn't. He wouldn't. You're avoiding the question. He wouldn't. You're avoiding the question, and on and on. Well, what ended up happening, friends, as this very intelligent, rather erudite man and I were discussing, back and forth and back and forth, you might, if you had been a bystander that day, you might have listened to my argumentation and my reasons, his argumentation and his reasons. And, and I want to just add here that the, the discussion was done in a very good spirit. And you might have said something like this, well, 50% for this side, 50% for this side. 
Yet as this was drawing to a close, I didn't want this just to be an intellectual discussion. And so I was thinking, what can I say to really bring the truth of the gospel home to this man's heart? And I said something that was very pointed. I said, friend, when this conversation is done, I'm going to be victorious. Now that was very much unlike the rest of the tenor of our conversation. And he said, what do you mean you're going to be victorious? I said, friend, I'm going to be victorious. And he said, what do you mean? He was a little put off by that. I said, because I have an ace up my sleeve. He said, what is that ace? I said, the ace at my sleeve is the question of ultimate reality. And friends, that is philosophical speak for what happens when you die. The very moment that I said that, he said, that's not fair. In other words, friend, what I was saying to that man is, if you hold to your beliefs, when you come to the end of your life, if you are right, you gain nothing. If you are wrong, you lose everything. But unlike me, if I come to the end of my beliefs, and I, I have correctly affirm that God exists, I will gain everything and yet I will lose nothing. At that, he walked away and we collected our goods and ended for the day. And I recommend to you today Pascal's wager. It was exactly what I used to bring, to bring some sort of affirmation of the intelligence and the reasonableness of the Christian message. And I recommend it to you today. The size of the prize, infinitely large. The size of the risk, non-existent. And friends, listen to me carefully. The chances that you can win, yes, you, that you can win eternal life through accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the chances are 100%. Friends, I invite you to make that decision today. I invite you to seriously consider making Jesus Christ your Savior, your friend. Won't you do that just now?